Most episodic television shows have a six or seven day shoot. But what's it like to edit a high profile miniseries with a 100 day shooting schedule? How do you handle that kind of workload and pressure? Perhaps most importantly, how does one even land a job like that? Hi, I'm film editor Lawrence Jordan for Master the Workflow, and we provide training and information for anyone whose goal it is to become a professional film and television editor. Today, we're talking with Simon Smith, a young editor out of the UK whose career is really on the rise. This season, Simon took home the Triple Crown of Editing Awards, an American Cinema Editor's Eddy, the Television Academy Emmy, and the British Film Academy BAFTA for his editing on the highly acclaimed HBO miniseries Chernobyl. We're really excited to speak with Simon and confident that editors at every level of the craft will get a lot out of what he has to say. And hey, if you like this video and want more insights about the world of professional editing, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. One last thing, we'd love to hear from you, so if you have any questions or feedback, leave them in the comments section below. One of us will be sure to get back to you. So without further ado, let's get into our interview with Simon Smith. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you became interested in editing. So uh, I, got, I got like, you know, some production runner jobs on, on some dramas when I was still at university um, and went to work on, on set, handing out call sheets and taking people for their lunch. And I actually, on one of those very early jobs, at the end of the day, I'd always go into the, the cutting room. Back then, the editors were on location with the rest of the crew because they didn't have internet that could send rushes, you know, from foreign countries. And I just found that to be the place that I was most interested, I guess. Like, I saw what they were doing. I liked the people that were in, in that department. They were super, like, enthusiastic and friendly. And I thought, oh, yeah, I like this bit. This, this bit feels like, to me, the storytelling bit. And I think everyone who, who starts out in that way, you know, seeing the different departments and experiencing the different departments, that's that's a good way of, of finding where you where you fit, you know, in, in a production sense. So I, I warmed to the editors. Uh, actually, the assistant editor on that job, when she went on to cut her first feature, she like gave me my first job as an assistant. So, so wow. that meeting that, you know, that meeting her definitely worked out. It was actually because on her first job uh, on a feature film, um, she had to cut on Final Cut Pro and she hadn't used Final Cut Pro before. And being a young student, that's what we'd been taught on. So oh, actually wow. I, I, I found myself having a, a skill set that put my CV to the top of her list in terms of possible assistance, you know, all the other assistants that she'd been working with were still avid based assistant so i, wow. I could suddenly go oh yeah i know how to use this thing so i got working with her on a feature film um we have a, a, an english actor called a, a much beloved english actor called danny dyer so it was a, a danny dyer film uh that, that i got to go and work on and then that that was it then i had a foot in the door i think the next job after that uh as an assistant was on avid and that job i'll be honest i went for the interview they said to me you know how to use Avid, right? And I'm like, yeah, 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 I know how to use Avid. And then I went straight <laughs> from that interview to uh, the bookstore and I bought the two books that they had in the bookstore on how to do Avid. Um, and I had like two weeks before the job started and every day I just knuckled down and like learned how to use Avid. I downloaded the free 30 day trial and I was like, right, I'm going to teach myself everything I need to know about how to use Avid. And I went into the job and luckily I was like second or third assistant even, you know, to two other guys who did know what they were doing. So they just showed me everything anyway. And then a few years later, I um, ended up as an assistant to an editor called Luke Dunkley. And I then stayed with Luke for a few years. You know, he, uh, I, I became his assistant. Every job he went on, he'd get me on. We got to know each other very well. All the directors he worked with knew me, all the producers he worked with knew me. Um, and that was great. And Luke is one of the best editors that, that um, I've come across and uh, so generous to me and taught me so much. And we really had a great time. And actually as well, he would always, you know, give me opportunities. So he would always let me cut scenes. He would always introduce me to people, you know, senior people in the cutting rooms and stuff like that. And it came to one job 
where he phoned me up and he was like, okay, I've got this new job coming, this new series. Can you come and assist me on it? And I'd been working with him for a few years and I was like, Luke, like, I love working with you, but I probably need to stop being an assistant now. Like I can only really come do this if it gives me a break into getting an episode. If I can have an episode, then totally. Good for you. If I have an episode, then, then maybe I need to like pursue other jobs until I can get an episode. And sure. he was like, yeah, okay, let me, let me talk to the director. And then the next thing I knew, the, the director phoned me up and he was like, so glad you're coming on, man. Like, it's going to be cool. Like, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be really wow. good. And in his head, he was like, yeah, we'll give, we'll give you an episode. You can do that. <laughs> so between the two of them, they, they gave me an episode. And I'll be honest, I think what was funny was, I don't know that they even told anyone. Um, we always knew that, like, if I messed it up, Luke was there so he could just take the episode and fix it, right? Right, um, right. So I think they just let me, like, be the editor and the director treated me like the editor and knew that I was editing that episode. But that was kind of it. Like, even when we had exec reviews where, like, the executives and so on would come in and watch, I don't think anyone knew that I was editing that episode. I think that they just didn't even think about that anyone had edited it, you know, or just, just guessed that Luke had edited it. Um they don't so, really care about I, us. They just want us to get the yeah, work they done. Did. As, long as, it looked, as long as it looked right, they didn't mind who was sitting in the chair, really. Um, <laughs> so that, that got me my first, uh, like, editor credit. And that was a big, you know, that was a big deal for me. And one thing, one thing I would say, like, people say, how hard is it to get that first credit? It's really hard to get that first credit. Yeah. You know, and, and I was very lucky to get that jump up from, from those people. Um, and I was also very lucky that it was on a really good show. I mean, that show went on to, to win awards and stuff like that itself. The second job is almost equally hard and in a totally different reason, right? Getting your second editor credit, suddenly you are now an editor, but you are on paper the worst editor. <laughs> you've only well... got... You've only got one job on your credit on your list. Every yeah. other editor that you'll be up against when they've got the the CVs, the resumes on the table, every other editor will have more than one. So <laughs> as soon as you become an editor, you become the worst editor. You might have been the best <laughs> assistant editor, right? Once you're an editor, you're the worst editor. So to get any, as soon as you went to a job where it was a new director or a new producer that you hadn't worked with before, if they've got one other person that they're interviewing, the likelihood is they're going to have more credits than you. So the second job was really tough. It was at that point, you know, that Luke kind of, you know, pushed me out the nest and he was like, right, off you go, go, go fly, <laughs> work it out, you know. Good luck. That was really tough. Yeah, that was really tough. So I had about a year of struggling with getting jobs but i did get an agent she you know she's still my agent she was super supportive but even to sell me as a as an editor to anyone was quite um a thing yeah you sound like you had a you know a perfect set of circumstances to get that bump up to editor but then you know unless you stay with that crew and it's a lot of episodes and it runs a couple of years you can't build up that that list of credits. I mean, even if you're just working on one show and you cut 10 episodes, people say, well, you know, this guy has some chops and he's obviously, and then also you meet a lot of directors and the producers will recommend you. Uh, but if you, you know, if you've only got a couple of, you know, if you got one episode and one credit, uh, it, it makes it tough. But but you did have a great set of circumstances there where you had a, a an editor who gave you a shot trusted you really nurtured you so you know everybody's path is going to be a little bit different but like you were saying earlier you know you count your blessings and you you know you you take the opportunities where you can but yeah that second gig can be very tough yeah yeah it was yeah. So, so actually the, the next year i did kind of what you said there i i worked on some shows that had multiple episodes i, I got two episodes on one show and then through that same company they were making another show so they put me on one of their other shows as well so I used to get you know a, a bundle of credits that then did say okay this guy 
has cut a few things. Still, the first thing that I'd cut was the best thing. You know, all these mm. other jobs that came along were almost a step down, but I had to bolster my resume a little bit. Um, and then Chernobyl was starting to be talked about. And again, what happened, Luke Dunkley, that editor that I'd been assisting for years, he had uh, edited a series for Johan, the director before, and Johan wanted Luke to, to cut Chernobyl. And Luke wasn't available. Luke was working on a feature film. And I remember saying to my agent, who was also Luke's agent, hmm. oh, can you, get me, can you get me a meeting for Chernobyl? I know Luke's not going to do it. I know he's not available. And she was like, Simon, you, you're not going to get a meeting on Chernobyl, right? It's not, it's not going to happen. <laughs> like, so supportive. <laughs> yeah. No, she's lovely. I, 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 I owe her a lot. You know, I, I, she, uh, uh, no, she was being realistic. Honest. She's being realistic. She's like, it's not going to happen. And I was like, I think I met Luke for a coffee or something. I was like, oh man, like put in a good word for me. And I kind of have a cocky, jokey way of saying these things. Like I don't actually expect him to do it, but <laughs> a, a bit like when I asked for the, for the editor credit the first time round, you know, when I said, oh, yeah. can I do it? Um, and he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, you know, I'll mention it to Yoan. And I didn't know that he would, but you know, he did. He said, Johan said to him, do you know anyone who, who would be good? And Luke said, um, well, he's not got the experience, but, you know, I taught him how to do it. So if, if, if you want someone who cuts how I cut, you know, how Luke cuts, then you should, you should meet Simon, you know, you should give, it, give him a chance. So suddenly my agent calls me and she says, right, you got this conference call interview with like, people phoning in from like seven different countries and um yeah it's a big deal get ready you know prepare yourself and she also i think she even said then because i knew who else was having these meetings and knew who the other editors were that were being interviewed she was like you won't get it um but it's good to have the interview <laughs> <laughs> so i um so i did a lot of homework a lot of homework and i went into that interview and you know just just nailed that interview and absolutely won over Yoan the director and won over Craig the writer and I already had or the the, the head of one of the production companies Jane she already knew who I was she that first drama gig that I had was for her company so she'd I'd been making tea for her for years you know she, <laughs> she knew who I was um so to have her to kind of be that welcoming on the phone and to also, you know, have her say, yeah, we, we should give him a chance, you know, because they would have had a conversation afterwards, of course. And then my agent called me up and she said, that, I don't know how you did it, but, you know, you've, 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 you're, you're going to get the job. So, wow. And, and that was, yeah, that was, I guess that was at Christmas. So August, I knew it was happening. Christmas, I had my interview, but then it still took like two or three months to sort out the deal. And we didn't have the read through until March and then the shoot didn't start until April. So from August to April, that's a long like lead time to kind of be wow. chasing a job. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, we started in April um, and it was a, it was a hundred day shoot. So it was pretty Whoa. intense. shoot. Yeah. And, and, and I'm in the, you know, I'm assembling every day in, in the hundred day shoot and there, so a hundred days, that was what, like five months. Thing, yeah four months five months that's a grind a hundred days of dailies that's a yeah. real you know yeah. you get fatigued cutting dailies every day for a hundred days yeah and it, i mean it was very much like a marathon that job you had to make sure that you were treating yourself right as you were going along so we were we were really good we kept to pretty much a nine till six work day maybe eight till six work day so it was never late you know, I never finished late. I always, because I knew I had to come in again for the next 99 days, right? So, <laughs> yeah. like, make sure you go home um, every night oh. and get, get some sleep. Um, we had fantastic of assistants and uh, assembly editor and, and, you know, VFX guys. So, yeah, it was, it was, it was fantastic. So, wow, what a story. I mean, uh, and and to be on a project like Chernobyl, which was so, you know, so powerful and, and frankly, in my opinion, important, 
you know, uh, with with a writer like like Craig Mazan, and uh, I mean, what a brilliant what a brilliant team you were working with. Uh, but they were in another country; they were like pretty far away, right? Yeah. So the interviews um, was all on conference calls. So I'd only spoken to the director and and Craig and that on these conference calls and so on. And then we had the one day of the read through where we all met each other. And then I didn't see them again for like another five months. Wow. So, what a trip. Yeah. So there was, there was literally like that one day meeting them and they're like, Oh, hi. Yeah. You're, you're Simon. You're, you're some of the episodes. Nice, <laughs> nice to meet you. We're all going to read the script together. And then, yeah, like it was just the edit team in London and we would get the rushes, you know, over the internet. And we were kind of left to it. There actually is a DGA rule um, that meant that, or, or Johan had this tied up in his contract, that meant that no one saw any assemblies until he'd had his pass. So, right. um, so for the five months that we're doing our assemblies, we're not showing them to people, you know, so uh, other than ourselves, really. Were you so, sending cuts um, back and forth to uh, to Johan? Not really. No, that mm. wasn't that isn't part of his process. Um, okay. I, I wasn't I wasn't the only editor. That there was Jinx Godfrey, and Jinx Godfrey is um, so uh, for me it was a big break. Chernobyl. Jinx Godfrey is a superstar movie editor. You know, award winning, established editor, and I suppose in a lot of ways like Luke on the other series she was a very safe pair of hands and and i'm sure you know she was always keeping an eye on on making sure that i was you know safely doing it sort of thing in in, in the nicest way you know what i mean like not it, it wasn't it wasn't anything else yeah exactly i mean they felt that they had a very you know a very experienced pair of uh, eyes to to look over you and that's uh that's something that uh, you know a lot of young editors experience, and it's it's frankly it's good. You're going to be you know soaking up all of that experience and getting feedback from someone who who who's got a ton of credit. So again, that sounds like an awesome awesome opportunity. So what were some of the biggest challenges for you on 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 a project like Chernobyl? I mean the the, the marathon of it, like the sheer length of time, and and even after we finished the five months of assembling. I was on that job for for 12 months. You know, I was in that same cutting room every day for 12 months. I think we took two weeks off at Christmas and we took one week off during the shoot. Um, Jinx and I, the other editor, we, we took turns to just cover each other so that we could make sure we got a week off before the shoot finished because we knew when the shoot finished, we wouldn't be taking any time off. So yeah, the marathon of it was the hardest thing. And then I suppose... Like the scale of it was far bigger than anything I'd done before, but I didn't really find that intimidating. I knew what I was on for me and in general was a big deal. So my my mantra every day when I walked in was don't f it up. Um, <laughs> like I would say to myself, don't f it up, don't f it up, don't f it up. If anything ever came along, I'd be like, okay, don't f it up. Just <laughs> get, get your head down and, and you know how to do this get it done yeah. and, and I'm quite good like that you know I, I think um, you know, sometimes that kind of situation can be overwhelming or get on top of people maybe you know that can sometimes be debilitating yeah. I, 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 I kept my, my head in it there was I suppose I'm sure there was a couple of like anxiety wobbles as I went along if it's of any use to anyone one thing I did on Chernobyl every day um, and I, I kind of recommend this to editors. Um, I, I meditated every day. So I'd, I'd meditate on the train. Um, I, I'd, I'd done a meditation um, course before um, and the, the commute to and from the office gave me a period of time when I could sit down and do my, my disciplined meditation uh, regime. And it, it sounds very like pretentious and stuff, but honestly, having to work at a computer all day editing to be able to do that and to have a it, you know to, to to treat your brain like a, a muscle and, and do a, a warm-up and a warm down you know with with that meditation 
absolutely really centers I, yourself I, I, yeah yeah I'd, I'd encourage it to anyone you know oh. if you can factor that in it's it's so helpful absolutely i've done it myself and i i, I agree i think uh you know, especially when the when the pressure's on. I mean, it's a good practice to do every day, but when the pressure's on, you know, it's it's important to figure out some kind of way to let the steam off because uh, whether it's taking a walk, jogging, you know, other exercise yeah. or, or or meditation, you know, you've got to treat yourself right because it, it's kind of like going to war when you go on a project of that scale yeah, and that right. length, right? I mean, you you find yourself fatigued. Uh, you know, yeah. and by the end of 12 months, you're kind of beat up. I mean, you're ready for that vacation in the Maldives or something like that. Yeah, right. I think when it when it finished, I did have probably four or five months off before the next job. And I went and did something completely different. I went and directed a fringe theatre piece. So wow. I, I, I walked away from the edit completely, didn't look at a computer really completely for a few months. Um, picked up a script, got some actors together, went and practiced a theatre piece and put that on. Um, and then I suppose the next job I picked up after that, yeah, was, was several months later. The other advantage that I had is that every day I was going into work and looking at rushes from Johan Rank and, and Jakob Ira and, and with Jared Harris and Stellan Skarsgård in. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good motivator. Like when, you, yeah. when you're looking at those rushes every day, it's pretty easy to stay um infused you know yeah so it, I was extremely lucky in that way yeah when you're looking at when you're looking at performances from those kind of actors it's it's inspirational i i, I know that when i'm getting great material to work with you're like yeah wow this is exciting you know this is this is a thrill so it really kind of it kind of amps you up and uh makes you want to come back the next day so tell us tell us a little bit about that i mean what kind of uh, what were you looking for in in performances what what do you look for in in performances particularly from somebody who's really good i mean how do you tell the difference from one take from another for example yeah um well so part of my working process and and this kind of fits in with like having scheduled start times and end times and my commute and all of that i try and have a very specific routine about how i i work so i like to sit down and watch the dailies you know properly watch them in in the run as, as they were shot and um, i'll sit away from the avid i'll go and sit in front of a television and and watch it like it would be on tv um i'll usually sit with one of the assistants you know and get them to watch it with me um and i have some shortcuts on on a mouse like a, a i've got it here so like I, I use one of these things with little buttons on it and i'll sit there watching i'll have this like in one hand and i'll have a pen and i'll like be making notes on every take and I can drop markers with this onto the rushes like straight away. So it, it will leave those markers on each clip. And whenever there's something that anything, whenever there's anything, I'll press it, you know, or, or like, and I've got a few different colors and I kind of have a, you know, a reflex to, okay, yeah, that one, that one. And it, it adds a marker, but just continues playing. I don't really stop and mess about. I try and just let, let the two hours, cause you've got two hours of rushes. You've got to get through it. You can't really keep stopping and starting. I'll tap the marker button, I'll make notes on every take and just look for magic really. When you're you working with people at that level, they're always giving you something. So it's not like I'm looking for a particularly good performance. What I'll do is once I've assembled the scene, I'll then look for a performance that best supports what we're trying to do with that scene it's always in context of what that moment in the story was so with jared harris if um Legasov is to be feeling a certain way in a scene I'm, I'm looking for the best performance that supports that story objective then i tend to i tend to finish the scene and then i might deliberately go back and look at it from someone else's point of view so like I've just done the scene with a general pass of cutting to the person who's talking and then I'll go back and I'll do another pass where I'll just look at what Jared's doing 
and I'll just try and focus in on Jared's point of view, especially there's that first scene where he goes into the Kremlin and he meets Shabina and Gorbachev for the first time. So I'd go back over all that stuff and really look at just Jared's performance. And, and um, I use script-based editing, like script sync. And my assistants will put everything into a, into a script so I can go every single line and just quickly audition them and look at what I'm getting there. It's, it's quite easy to pass everything through a, a filter layer in, in that way. Compare and contrast, yeah. And get to know all yeah. the material. Sure, sure. Very cool, very yeah. cool. So um, let's switch gears a little bit. It was a big visual effects show. Obviously, you're recreating, you know, this this massive, um, you know, catastrophe. How 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 did you deal with the visual effects? What uh, what kind of challenges were you up against uh, in that respect? Did you have a visual effects editor in the cutting room with you? Were you doing any of the yeah. comping on your own? And um, so all in, I think there were like 800 visual effects across the five episodes. Um, wow. We had That's a lot. A, yeah. Yeah. We had, we had a fantastic uh, visual effects editor. She's probably more experienced as a VFX editor than I am as an editor. You know, she, she's solid. She's been doing this. She, she absolutely knows her stuff. Um, so she managed the, you know, the pipelines between us as editors and then Deneg, who were doing the big effects, and Deneg are like, you know, they do Interstellar and Christopher Nolan movies, you know. Yeah. Um, and then we had these two, most of the time there were two, and then we got a third guy who joined us who were our in house VFX artists, um, and they were like on the same corridor as, as me. So, you know, you all have breakfast and cups of tea together and stuff like that. And I loved it because anything you desired, you could ask for and they would be oh. able to do and you would have back in your avid that afternoon you know sweet and oh wow to, to the point where like oh i really like what jared's doing in this shot but it doesn't work with the continuity with where stellan is can you like just find a stellan from somewhere else to like match the continuity for it yeah done right that's done um so we never had that's a, nice like we could literally yeah we could literally pick any performance we wanted and they, they they would do everything and then much bigger things they would you know uh, add in the helicopters and the and the power plants and that in the background we had a whole scene in episode two which was the helicopter crash scene very heavy on vfx so dean egg would provide us with some 3d animatics and then our in-house guys would kind of cut those up and almost like in a 2d way they would be able to retime it all to fit my shots on my timeline so i could make the edit or i could say i want this to go a bit quicker or i, I need more helicopters in here kind of do that composite using the elements from the 3d animatic so having those three guys doing the the in-house stuff liana um who was uh, our visual effects editor who could also do tons of great stuff in the avid you know she would do all sorts of temps in the avid that are far beyond my like i don't know how she did it using using avid effects and then we had lindsay who was a vfx producer um on the corridor as well so he was like you know he, he'd been on set for a lot of it but he was also in charge of the entire vfx department we had all of the resources we needed to to get stuff done really it was great that's awesome it's great that uh it, it's so nice to have you know, a team that yeah. uh, inspires confidence and, like you say, gets it done. You know, as soon as you as soon as you ask for it, uh, or as, as soon as possible. And um, you, you know, it's it's exciting to hear like how you work collaboratively, feed off each other. Um, it's it's really one of the really fun parts of the job. So very cool. How were you on time, like, you know, per episode? Were you coming in pretty close to time? How much did a particular episode differ from, let's say, the initial cut through the final cut? Um, so I think I tend to overcut quite a lot. Like, I, I have quite long assemblies, certainly longer than other people. Um, I remember there's a scene in the end of episode two where the divers are in the like the blackness of this like water and it's dark 
And there's this one shot of, it's just of water, just with some reflection on it. And man, in my first cut, I let that shot hold for for so long. <laughs> and I loved it. I, I loved every every second of it. And I remember the director like writing me a note saying, this is ridiculous. Like, why have you got this <laughs> shot so hard? You need to you need to claw that back. And I think it went from like twelve seconds down to like seven seconds and, and eventually something like three seconds. So I, I do tend to cut quite long. I don't think I, I need to cut that long. Um it's just part of you know, just part of my process really. Yeah. Um but yeah, like we didn't really lose many scenes, if any, from the show. There's not many deleted scenes. We didn't really move scenes out of order in any way they're all as as scripted there were quite a lot of changes in episode five i think there were more scenes at the top and tail of episode five i think we knew before we even got to the fine cut of episode five like we we'd cut episodes one two three four and we knew when we got then those scenes were going to kind of go because we just want to get to the trial and and what happened so even at the end of that episode, we kind of end the story when Legasov comes out of the, the court and the and the little holding bay and drives off into the distance. And I think when it got to that point, we kind of knew it was over, you know, right. to put any more into it would have just been extraneous in a way. Yeah. Didn't need to. And people have sat with you for five episodes when it's over. And it's funny because the amount of things you watch actually where there's so many endings, you know, like so many almost false endings, like it ends and then it ends again and then it ends. And I think I really admire the decision makers and, and that decision would have come from, you know, Craig and Johan and at that end of it, it's not like a decision you're making as an editor. Um, right. That decision to just, when it was ended, it was ended. I thought it sure. was, was great. Really loved that. Sure. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, the technical end. How how technical do you feel you are, like with hardware, software, you know, editing system, etc.? Well, so I don't think you have to be, right? I don't think um, there are editors who are not at all technical, and I absolutely admire and idolize. But me personally, very technical. Like I, 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 I kind of live and breathe the, the the technical side in a way um i never realized until i'd sat with a few directors like i'm pretty fast like at, at what i do um and they will say that to me oh well you're really fast like to <laughs> i kind of try and get to a point where i can work as fast as i'm thinking right and i think i probably think pretty fast as well i'm probably like quite quick to make connections and want to try stuff so it's I do have a director I work with a lot who sits next to me and it's great because we can kind of experience what we're thinking and what we're trying in real time and the Avid can keep up with that. Um, I use like a um, Avid artist mix for the audio tracks and for like live mixing so we can kind of like live mix and music cue in and, and try that out and all, all of the and auditioning different takes or different tries. As I say, I use script sync or script based editing so I can quickly look at different options and get those in. So yes, I, I would say that personally one of my strengths as an editor is just how inherently technical I am so that I can creatively work very quickly. I, I think the creativity is the most important thing, right? And if you're if the technology is good enough, it ends up it gets itself out of the way. Right. Absolutely. Right. So I completely I'm agree. Yes. I'm trying yes. to achieve a, a level of fluency, trying to be like a musician, right? You wouldn't say to a, an amazing piano player, how technical are you? But of course they're technical. Of course, like that's what they're doing. Um, so I, I humbly liken myself to a, to a, an amazing piano player. <laughs> <laughs> Well said, well said. But but I agree 100%. I mean, uh, particularly what you mentioned about, you know, when ideas are flowing and you're able to like execute those ideas. And you've probably had the experience where you're working with a director and you're kind of just on the same wavelength and you're doing the idea. And then they say, yes, exactly. That's what I was thinking. And, you know, how'd you know I was thinking that or things like that? Because, 
you know, again, uh, being technically proficient at, at our, our tools uh, enable us to be in the flow and, and more creative in the moment. And uh, that, that's a really that's always an awesome feeling. I, I, I you know, I I don't surf, but I imagine it's something like surfing. You know, I mean, you're just in the moment and and you're really humming along. Or like you say, like, uh, you know, like playing music, it's uh, it's a pretty it's a pretty great part of our job. Yeah. And I've seen other people do it in their own jobs as well. When you see someone who does it well with visual effects or you see someone who does it well with even seeing someone who does it well with Final Cut Pro X, right? Seeing them, ah, they really know how to do that. Working with a grader, you know, going in and working with a colorist who you kind of say what you want and then they can spin those balls around and do all this magic. And boom, it's like an extension of, of what they're doing um yeah i feel like i i can do that and that also certainly helps me go home at 6 p.m right yeah i think there's a lot of people who they have a thought and they're like okay now hang on while i do that and it takes them a while to execute that or do that yeah yeah absolutely so um we've covered some of this other stuff i wanted to ask you about um you know, you, you had you've talked about it a little bit, um, you know, editing demands a lot of hours and, uh, you know, takes a big chunk out of your out of your life. You know, we're creative people and we have to be very sort of committed to our to our work. How, how do you do the uh, how do you manage the work life balance? You, you know, uh, you mentioned meditation, but, you know, are there other other methods you use? Yeah, like so, I mean, on Chernobyl, we were so- super fortunate we always had our weekends we never worked saturdays and sundays never were asked to work saturdays or sundays um the director the execs the writer they all had kids you know so they were all super respectful of family life and family time um i just think i you know i was super lucky to work with people who all appreciated and and respected that way of working it was not hard but but I even do on any job, you know, when it gets to six o'clock, it's diminished for me, it's diminishing returns after that. It's almost a false economy because if I stay late the next day, I end up having to redo everything I've done the day before, or I end up having to come in late or whatever. There's only so much my brain can handle. And I know those limits. And Luke, who I worked for as an assistant for years, he really set that as an example you know I really learned that from him as well as I learned you know the politics and the and how to look after yourself and all that from him as well as how to press the shortcut buttons on the Avid and and and, and how to think about story um so you know I just I do prioritize it and I don't get sucked into having to be at the Avid all day I also try and always um keep watching stuff i'm such a keen like cinema goer and film watcher i mean i've watched like i've watched two films today already i've I've probably (laughs) watched another one this evening um and i've watched a couple of episodes of something on apple tv um (laughs) so I, i kind of consume a lot and make sure that i'm always learning yeah learning and and taking stuff in and 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 trying to find new filmmakers or or new things to watch i'll always say to both my assistants and my superiors like like my directors and and so on what have you been watching what did you watch this weekend i'll write that down i'll make sure i watch that this this week you know the train commute helped that a lot i would watch a lot of stuff on the train as well so i i I do make time for those things and i do take um breaks between jobs so I, I cool. have no trouble with taking like four months off after a job. I very, very, very rarely would go straight from one job into another. I just wouldn't. I wouldn't be interested. Smart. Very smart. Um, yeah. yeah just, I, kind of, uh, I kind of feel that those those opportunities will come round again. I've yeah. not ever been suckered into the idea of if you don't take this, it's not going to come back. You know, I don't believe yeah. in that. So. Yeah, that's a that's a really good philosophy to have because otherwise you turn around and you, you know, twenty years have gone by. You you know, you haven't seen your kids grow up, and uh, yeah. 
you know, you don't get that kind of stuff back. So good for you, man. Good. But you've also done a bit of directing. And uh, how does that inform your work as an editor? Um, so I think I, I get on really well with directors. I try and, you know, aim to work for the best directors that I can or, or that there are, you know, Jan Renk is, is what, like one of the best directors in, in the world doing what he does. And, and I really feed off that. I'd, I'd always punch up in terms of trying to get a job with a, a, a much more senior director. I think I'd struggle if I, unfortunately, I think I'd struggle the other way around if it was like a new director. Like I do also, I do want to direct more, you know, like, as I said, I, I directed a bit of theatre after Chernobyl finished. I'm, I'm now working on some short film stuff at the moment. I have directed in the past. Kind of, I suppose it kind of does feed in. I think it's just a mindset, isn't it? It's like the, the directors that I like working with, I feel like we are excited about the same kind of things. You know, we get excited about the same kind of thing. We probably have the same, um, banks of, of reference or things that we enjoy. So like Mark, who I, a director who I work with a lot, I'll always be coming in. It'll be like, what have you watched? What are, what are you thinking about? What films are, are inspiring this piece or, or what, what, how should we take this? So I think that certainly helps, but you know, um, then there's other editors who they, they've got no interest in it. I, I will say, I. What I don't like about directing is the time it takes and the and the fuss, right? Uh, when yeah. I was very early on in my career, when I was doing that production run around of working on films in different departments, I worked on um, a film directed by Joe Johnson, who I think he was an editor as well. Hmm. And it, he was directing a film called The Wolf Man, right? Um, a werewolf film with... Um, Benicio del Toro in it as a werewolf mm -hmm. and I remember someone saying to me oh you want to get down to set today they've got this shot where he smashes through the window and he jumps down through the window and hits the ground below right you want to get there for that shot it's going to be a big deal so I was super excited young like oh yeah I'm going to get down to set I'm going to make sure I've done all my work so I can get down to set and I ran down to set and I, I waited and I was like patient and like this guy smashes the window and he's in this like furry costume and then he jumps and he's on a cable and he like slowly like moves down and he hits the, <laughs> the craft mat on the ground and then they yell cut and then they're like we're gonna go again and it was like half an hour before they, oh, yeah. they went again i was like this is rubbish like <laughs> this is really not like executing stuff as fast as you can think right what i was yeah. saying about editing being able to execute ideas as fast this is not that and that <laughs> really put me off and i think that's why i moved into editing and away from directing in that stage because i just can't i can't sit around like that i get so bored and impatient <laughs> um, with that I, part of the process so that's yeah i completely feel you man i mean that that is being on the set uh, until they're rolling is is just torture. I mean, just all of that waiting around is is really hard for my personality. So I, I get it. Okay, so uh, I want to ask you a question that I ask pretty much everyone because I think it's really important for our students is um, what advice do you have for people who want to become editors? Um. Okay, so um, I, I would definitely give this to assistants. If if you want to become, if you want to become anything, look at what it is that that person is doing, and do that as much as you can. So, to become an editor, generally you have to have been an assistant editor, or you. A lot of us come up through the assistant ranks, right? And I see a lot of assistants who spend their days being really, really, really brilliant assistant editors that won't get you to become an editor you need to be a very good assistant editor but then make sure you're filling your other time with doing the things that the editor does as an assistant you don't do so make sure you read the scripts read all the versions of the script right it's there sent to you make sure you read it make sure you read the call sheets make sure you watch 
all the rushes like so many assistants now with the technology how it is they kind of bring it in also sync it up name all the clips export it out they don't necessarily watch it and even if they do watch it they watch it for technical reasons no sit and watch the rushes as if you were the editor sit and read the script as if you were the editor watch the cuts that the editor has done watch the cuts every day that the editor has done to see how it's changed and progressed because when you finally get that opportunity to sit in the chair and be the editor if you haven't been practicing you're gonna like feel so out of your depth whereas if every if you've taught yourself watching dailies watching rushes is a hard thing to do you really need to learn how to do that well so it's no good only starting doing that when you become an editor you need to have train yourself how to watch rushes as early as possible so i always enjoyed as well anyway but i always made sure that i was um i guess imitating the editors in what they were doing in work and just making sure that i'd done my assistant duties i wasn't trying to like do anything more than get get it done get it done properly but then what is it that they're doing okay do that. Um, another bit of advice that I'd give to assistants and, and runners and so on, um, make the coffee, right? Making the coffee gets you in the room, right? Because yeah. And if you can be in the room, if you can see what they're doing, if you can make your face known, if you can, as soon as you take in the coffee, you can then be asked to do other stuff or be invited to do other stuff or you see what they're doing. And it's like, oh, Simon, like as an assistant, Simon, thanks for the coffee. Can you uh, go and do this visual effect? Or can you get me these sound effects? Or can you, whatever. Making the coffee gets you in the room. You want to be in that room as much as possible without interfering or being unwelcome. So you're always welcome if you're bringing coffee in. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I'd, 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 I'd imitate what the editor's doing, reading scripts, watching rushes, all that. And I'd make sure that I was taking the coffee in. Good advice. I, I, I like that. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Simon, for uh, oh. hanging out with us today. I really appreciate it. Congratulations on Chernobyl and uh, the BAFTA. I'm sure that was a thrilling experience. And yeah, they are. That's that's the BAFTA at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yet looking good. Proper one. <laughs> Uh, no, really, uh, congratulations, and uh, and thanks for taking the time. Uh, much luck in the future, and uh, let's stay in touch. I'm, I'm sure we'll be uh, seeing more uh, great work from you and uh, and hearing from you. Yeah, hope so. Hope so. Cool. Thank you so much, man. Thanks, man. Thanks, guys.